thank you, Dash, and thank you to Hitbag and everyone else that uh, contributed to bringing me out here and sharing with you guys today. Really excited to be here. So yeah, my name's Gabe, as Dash said, and uh, I really like bananas. And uh, today I'm gonna hopefully share some useful information with you folks about how I grow bananas, which isn't the only way or necessarily the best way, but it's what I'm currently doing. Maybe in five, 10 years, I'll be doing it in a totally different way, but this is what I'm doing now. Um, and um, we'll, I'm happy to take questions as well, but we're gonna do it all at the end so that people on Zoom can hear because there's like this many people or more also online watching this happening right now. So, all right, uh, so next slide. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna start with is that even though I love trees and Dash loves trees and we all love trees and we're talking about trees, bananas are not trees. And that might seem kind of like a trivial sort of, sort of fun fact, but it's really the core of understanding not only how bananas work, but how management decisions are gonna affect you know, what you do to them and how they're gonna respond to it. Um, they're much closer related to heliconias, ginger, bird of paradise, than, um, and even to corn than any tree. And so their biology um, you know, is more in a plant like that. Uh, there's no wood and there's no branches. Um, and they're impermanent in that they're not gonna be there for you know, decades necessarily, but they're also constantly regenerating. So it gives some different opportunities. Um, the only banana tree that I like to say exists is like a family tree. So here's a, <laughs> this is actually old and outdated, but it's just kind of a cool old botanical representation of bananas and how they're related to um, cannas, heliconias, ginger, bird of paradise, et cetera. Next slide. So going a little bit deeper into why it really matters that bananas aren't trees, I have this little table that just sort of uh, compares things that trees do, how bananas do it differently, and why that is an important consideration. Trees are long-lived. They're on the order of decades to centuries, some even millennia. Uh, bananas are sh relatively short-lived. Um, wild bananas that have seeds that are just wild plants out in nature, um, are typically pioneer species. They occupy forest edges, gaps in the forest where a tree falls. Um, when sunlight hits the soil directly, the seeds will germinate. Uh, the plants come up and maybe grow for th you know, a few years. They make seed, the seed disperses. The other trees in the forest start growing up again and filling in the canopy. And by then, the bananas are done. So, you know, in... Um, in, the, in their evolutionary biology, they're not built to be long-lived plants. And the way that they can persist, um, sometimes in Hawaii or other places up in the mountains for decades or centuries, is by being completely isolated and away from everyone and everything, which works if you can do that, but if you wanna interact with your bananas, then it's not gonna work. So, um, Bananas are short-lived, but um, you know, an important thing about that is that they're quick to yield. So in like a mixed crop system, they're of course gonna be something that could give you a return quicker, um, but you gotta keep in mind that they should really be viewed as temporary placeholders. Planting a banana with the expectation that it's gonna be there forever, like if you plant an ulu or a coconut or a mango, is you're off to the wrong start, you know, uh, right off the bat. Trees stay where you put them. Bananas tend to wander. Uh, this is a really important consideration if you're working with irrigation. Uh, I personally grow in a relatively dry area on the North Shore of Oahu. We get about 30 inches a year on average. This year was maybe closer to five or 10 inches <laughs> so far. Um, so irrigation is critical. And having irrigation lines anywhere near your plants, um, if you put them right up to a plant when you uh, plant it, you know, six months later, you're gonna have keiki come up on the other side of it and pinch it and cut off water for the rest of the line. So you always gotta be aware that bananas aren't gonna stay where you put them. If you put them near buildings or sidewalks or other types of infrastructure, they're not gonna behave very well, especially with something like weed mat. I see a lot of times people, you know, like for a tree, you can put a square weed mat down, cut a hole in it, put your plant in there. Bananas don't care about that. They're gonna <laughs> spread underneath, they're gonna poke through it, they're gonna eat it up, it's gonna be a mess. So. Another difference. Um, 
Trees have a sensitive outer layer, the cambium, which is just under the bark because they undergo really drastic secondary growth. They're always trying to grow out. Um, what that means for trees is that you don't want to mulch right up to it because it's a living layer right there. You want to kind of have a little bit of a buffer zone. Uh, for bananas, the outer layer is really, really tough, but it's the inner core that's really sensitive. All of the growth of a banana occurs inside the plant. You can't see the growth. Anything you see of a banana coming out is after it's been growing for a few weeks. It grows from the bottom of the plant and pushes up. So the actual point of growth is essentially at ground level in the middle of the plant. Um, what that means, though, is that you can actually freely mulch around the plants and kind of put as much as you want around it without worry, and they'll grow right through it, and they'll be protected from it. So you know, it's kind of an advantage relative to a tree. Um, and the last really important thing is wind resistance. Um, I often see bananas used or people inquire about using them for wind breaks. Um, but all things being equal, um, bananas are not wind resistant plants. They're soft, mushy, weak plants. Um, you get hurricane force winds coming and there's a good chance your bananas will be flat. They're not dead though. Like if a tree cracks in half and splits over, it might be an end of that tree. The banana can regrow, but they're not necessarily going to resist that wind. Um, so if you do want to use them in a windbreak, I always suggest to consider them as a short-term temporary windbreak for a longer windbreak. You know, maybe you're planting, uh, I don't know, whatever species you want, milos, jackfruit, bamboos, whatever you want, um, panics even for a windbreak. But if you want a windbreak for your windbreak, maybe the bananas are good for that first, you know, two to five year period where um, you're just trying to get established and then you would phase them out. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a b sort of a technical part just to get us familiar with the different parts of the banana plant we kind of talked about earlier. Um, down here, the meristem on the left there, uh, it's in the middle of the plant and like I said, that's where all growth comes from. And the true stem of a banana is underground, it's the corm. It's almost the same botanical structure as callo. Um, it's a starchy, um, fleshy bulb of sorts that's underground, and that's where all of the roots come from, it's where all of the leaves come from, and it's where all the new shoots, which are the cakey, come from. So, you know, managing around the ground level is very, very important for bananas. Um, they're really shallow rooted. 90% of the roots are within the first foot or two of soil, and a lot of the feeder roots are right along the surface, so you really want to make sure that um, that's why mulching really helps with bananas because that's where they're really absorbing a lot of their water and nutrition from. But also you want to be mindful about not disturbing around the roots of bananas too much. Um, even though they're constantly making new ones, like a banana root typically lasts about four months. Um, it goes out, you know, it does its thing, it dies, but it makes, it's always making new ones. But if you're having other types of gardens or activities around your bananas and you're constantly digging them up, for example, if you plant... Um, sweet potatoes or olena near your bananas, um, and you go to dig them up, you're inevitably gonna be digging up all the banana roots too, and they'll tolerate it, but they won't appreciate it. And it's definitely not helpful for them to have you know, productive, longer-lived, healthy um, growth. Um, the pseudostem is what we typically call, you see as the stem or the trunk. It's called the pseudostem because it looks like a stem, but it's really more of the structure of like a big leak. It's a bunch of overlapping leaves, and that kind of relates back to the point that there are no woody tissues in banana, and everything above ground is leaf material. Uh, that's a really important consideration, too, um, when you need to remove or take out a banana. Many of you probably know this. If you cut down a banana, all you're doing is encouraging it to grow back again. So removing a banana from a situation um, physically means removing the corm. Everything above ground is fluff, but it's really the corm that you need to focus on as far as propagation or removal or health. Um, next slide. Uh, basic stats, many of you are probably aware of this, but for those that might not be or are just getting into it, um, it's just kind of a good metric. Bananas take about one year to the first harvest from planting. Um, that's really variable depending on variety and conditions, but that's a decent baseline for the first planting. Um, the second, or the, the first fruiting, sorry. Um, subsequent fruiting is all over, over the board. It depends on the variety, it depends on locations, it depends on management, but reasonably you could expect about two to three bunches a year 
after the first year once a mat is established if everything is going well. Um, the first three months are very, very critical to growth. Um, I call it no Santa Clausing. You can't be good right at the end and expect good results. Um, I see this especially with this, uh, I'll just call it a myth, that if you cut off the male bud, the little dangly purple bit at the end of the bunch, you cut that off, you're a good banana grower because that's what you do. But in reality, if that's all you did extra, you get no points for it. It doesn't do anything. Um, especially if you wait until it's grown um, a few weeks. If the fruit is already out there, that was determined, like the number of fruit is determined up to three to six months before you ever see it. Um, the size of the fruit is determined, the, the maximum size is determined up to nine months before. And again, like that first three months are really, really critical. If a plant is struggling right when it's planted and it's rooted and growing but not that healthy and then you start treating it well, it'll still fruit and grow, but that bunch is gonna be highly, highly diminished. The good news is, going back to that bananas are not trees and they can regenerate, um, the new keiki that come up can be like a next opportunity, hopefully, to have uh, a better yield. Um, but you really gotta think about bananas as a sort of continuous, um, like everything that they want, they want almost at all times forever. So if whether that's, um, you know, water, fertilizer, sunlight, they'll take their maximum amount from day one until they're gone. You don't really need to worry too much about are they in too much sun to begin with or are they having too much water? As long as you have good drainage, there really isn't a thing as too much water. They don't like standing water in the roots. They can tolerate it, but they don't want it permanently. Um, so you just wanna kind of think about that, um, yeah, as far as giving everything they want for their whole life. In Hawaii, I give their, expect, their effective lifespan at about one to five years. Um, there are certainly cases of bananas living way longer than that, um, but when you look across the board, what you should expect to get out of it, I'd say if you make it to five years with a healthy plant and then something happens, you still won, like you succeeded. Um, you know, think of something like tomatoes. Um, if you plant a tomato plant and you get 20 pounds of delicious, beautiful, ripe tomatoes, and then the plant starts declining and it gets leaf diseases and fungus and the fruit starts rotting, you wouldn't be like, ah, tomatoes are bust. You're like, no, it's still a successful crop. It's just reached the end of its thing. You know, it might still be alive, but it's not gonna be productive anymore. So I would say one to five years is your ballpark range. Personally, I aim for two to three years tops. Um, my strategy when growing is trying to get enough yield out of my plantings to have it be economically viable and worth our effort to put them in, but then quit while we're ahead. You don't wanna get into a situation where all of your plants are starting to get infected with a bunchy top virus or infested with corn weevils or nematodes, and then at that point, when you see a huge decline and all your plants are sick and dying to say, okay, now's the time to take it out because then you're not gonna have anywhere to source new healthy plants from. If you do source them from somewhere else and you plant them next to those plants, you're gonna be you know, introducing them to those pests and diseases from day one. So it's really better to take them out just at or maybe just below their peak of health um, and then try to perpetuate that you know, kind of indefinitely if you wanna grow bananas. Um, another metric just to consider for small farm plantings, I mean, I'm a banana grower primarily, but I do have experience um, in history in growing a lot of different crops. Um, veggie production, all kinds of different things. Um, so for like a small mixed farm, if, if bananas are something that you wanna offer on a regular basis at a farm stand or farmer's market or through CSA, and you wanna say, yes, I have bananas, at least in some quantity, you're gonna wanna aim for at least 100 plants. Um, and that's just a biological metric because if you have less than 100 plants, you'll have bananas, but you're gonna be more in feast and famine or irregular, which is fine but just as a sort of ballpark to wrap your head around and say like, okay, we want bananas to be a crop that we offer on a somewhat regular basis that you know, we can bring to market reliably. 100 plants is gonna be your starting point minimum. Next. Um, we're gonna talk about diseases and then this is gonna loop back into uh, some more production stuff. Um, I'm gonna start though with uh, black cigatoka, which 
is not really that, I don't know, popular of a disease. Like people don't talk about it much. Um, but it is, I put it first because it is the, it is the most common banana disease. Um, and one of the most destructive in the world, this disease um, is the reason why, if you've ever heard that commercial export bananas are one of the most heavily sprayed crops in the world, and it's true, um, over, up to once a week or more, so like over 50 sprayings a year of even in organic banana production for export, um, it's still usually like really toxic copper-based fungicides and stuff. It's, um, it's organic, but it's not safe. <laughs> um, it's because of this disease. It's a leaf fungus that essentially rots the leaves um, and it reduces their ability to photosynthesize and collect energy for the plant. It's really, really common um, in wet areas or in wet seasons. And you'll see it start with these kind of, uh, another name for it is black leaf streak, because you'll see these kind of like little black streaks that end up um, starting to decay around them and turn yellow. Eventually, big portions of the leaf will start dying and you know, the leaves just are not healthy. The thing about it though is it only affects um, older leaves. So as the newer leaves are growing, um, you won't see it, but it's on all of the older leaves. That becomes a problem when it's fruiting, which I'll show next, but not quite ready. Um, the control for this though, there's different sprays, there's some different work with like um, competitive biological applications, you know, like other fungus and bacteria that may outcompete the pathogenic fungus. But for you know, small to medium scale growing, especially if you're not in maybe like Hilo, like I don't know, over there, it might be <laughs> impossible to evade. But if you remove the infected leaves when they're about 30 to 50% damaged and lay them with the bottom of the leaf facing the ground, um, you can control it relatively well. Uh, that's because the spores on them eject out the bottom and then blow in the air. So if they're facing down when they eject out of the leaf, they won't be as prone to getting picked up in air currents and spreading around to other plants. Um, having really good airflow in your planting is really important. Um, that's partly can be achieved by how you plant them in density and your arrangement, which we'll talk about later, but also in pruning. Um, having dead, dry leaves all over your plants um, is not a good idea for a number of reasons. One, it makes a lot more stagnant, humid air around the plants, which can encourage a disease like black cigatoka. Um, but it also is really, it makes rats really happy, which you may have noticed. All that dead material makes it really appealing for them to pull it off and make nests in the bunches and start eating the fruits. So cleaning up the plants and having them be, you know, relatively free of dead material on a regular basis is um, a good idea all around. Um, for black zigotoka, there actually are resistant varieties and they're pretty solid. Uh, Namwa, which is a really common variety that a lot of you are probably familiar with, is essentially 100% resistant to it. So in some cases, the easiest uh, strategy for control might just be planting a resistant variety. Next slide. Um, these are just some uh, Siga It might be a little hard to see in these photos, but um, this plant on the left is completely infested. And um, when I mentioned before that it only affects the older leaves, what that means is that um, the new leaves are resistant, but when they fruit, a banana stops making new leaves. Each banana shoot is terminal. Um, there's kind of a, a myth that bananas only fruit once and then die, but it's not quite true. Each shoot fruits once, but a keiki will come up and fruit again, and that's the same plant. They're connected underground. It's just like an underground branch of sorts. Um, but when they stop making new leaves, all of the leaves start getting older. This plant on the left side, you can see, has no more leaves, but it has a bunch. They were completely defoliated from black zygotoka. And what that means is that that bunch isn't gonna be able to fill out as well. So even though it's the full number of um, fruits and it's a full size bunch, it won't be able to reach its potential. And it can cut yield in half by, or cut yield up to 50% or more. It can cut it in half just because that bunch is no longer able to fill out um, because it doesn't have any more leaves. So controlling cigatoka, especially in wet areas or in wet seasons, um, I'll personally, even though we're in a really dry area, if we have a week or two of rain, I know I gotta get out there and start trimming leaves and try to keep it under control um, so that we don't have too much cigatoka. Next slide. Bunchy top virus, okay. I know this is everyone's favorite disease to talk about. Um, I like talking about it too. I just want to say first and foremost, though, that although bunchy top is really a bummer, um, 
I've kind of come to peace with it in terms of how to manage it. I grow on Oahu, which is a bunchy top cesspool. Um, it's compl- very high pressure all the time. Um, I really wish I didn't have to deal with bungee top, but that's not a reality. So um, how you deal with it is the only way forward. And I've personally found a way to kind of, you know, we're, we, we have a system. It, it works. Um, it'll never go away. It's never something that we're going to completely eradicate. But it is no, it's not something that keeps me from growing bananas or is at all my biggest concern for growing bananas. Um, it's caused by banana bunch top virus, BBTV, um, and it's spread by the banana aphids, Pentalonia nigra nervosa. The banana aphids only feed on bananas. There's a really closely related species, Pentalonia caladii, that feeds primarily on uh, taro, gingers, heliconias. There is a little bit of crossover, but by and large, the aphids that feed on bananas mostly feed on bananas, and they're the ones that are transmitting bunchy top. Um, this is the only way that it's spread. This is a really common misconception that I hope to instill in everyone here. Bunchy top can only spread from a living plant to another living plant by the banana aphid. The good news in that is it's not spread on tools and it's not spread in the soil. If you have an infected plant and you remove it, as long as there's no corn material left that's gonna sprout infected keiki, that site is safe to plant with a healthy bunchy top free plant on the same day. Um, you don't need to clean your tools. Trust me, if you could infect bunchy top by tools, I would have shaved at least a year off my master's thesis because I had to individually rear all these infected aphids and move them by hand to make sure that the plants are actually getting it, um, which is good news. It's only from plant to plant. Um, controlling the aphids, actually I, I have up here that controlling the aphids is a technique, but this is an old slide and I forgot to update it. Um, controlling the aphids actually doesn't really work, so you don't need to worry about them. Um, and the other thing, too, is when you see the aphids, that doesn't mean that they have bunchy top. They don't have to have bunchy top. Almost every banana plant has the aphids at some point, but it's only if they came from an infected plant that they can get the virus. Um, aphids are also born pregnant, and they give live birth, and they can reproduce or, like, every four days, basically. They can double their populations almost every four days. Bunchy top virus, though, the way it works in the banana aphids is that they're not born with the virus. So they actually have to still actively feed on the plant. They're born, and then they have to, you know, come out of mom and immediately start feeding on that infected plant, and then they get the virus. And then they have to be ones that, um, uh, through different crazy insect population dynamics, decide to sprout wings later on and then get blown or fly off to another plant. So it's kind of an inefficient virus, which is why you'll always see plants that escape infection. You'll have um, completely susceptible varieties, really high pressure. There'll always be plants that just somehow don't get it. It doesn't mean they're resistant, unfortunately. It just means they dodge the bullet. Um, you know, luck of the draw. Um, but anyway, um, next slide. Here's some symptoms of bunchy top virus. Diagnosing the symptoms and knowing what to look for is really important. Um, I get asked all the time about plants that, you know, if they're infected or not. Um, also, people think they have bunchy top virus, but it's something else. Um, so, you know, it might be a different control strategy or a different consideration. There's nutrient deficiencies. There's other, um, there's insect pests that can all mimic bunchy top um, virus. Even um, herbicide sprays. When I was doing my master's thesis, our um, field station crew, um, I'd asked them to mow the aisles, but I don't know, they just decided to herbicide them. Um, and the drift of them got on some of my plants and it creates these symptoms that look a lot like bunchy top. And I was like, hey, you can't be doing this. I'm trying to like actually track bunchy top symptoms. Um, and it's really confusing when I have plants that are herbicide damaged and look like bunchy top. But the bunchy top symptoms are pretty specific. Um, there is some variability between varieties, but by and large, what you're gonna see is reduced leaf size. So a banana, the way it grows is every leaf is gonna be larger than the previous one until one of two things happen. Either it's about to fruit and it'll start making those little smaller leaves and then the bunch comes out, but it's kind of obvious to tell because it's a big healthy plant and then a week or two later, there's a fruit bunch. 
Um, or there's a problem like bunchy top virus. So if you ever see a leaf, a new leaf that's smaller than the previous leaf, look out for bunchy top. Um, but then look on to the next steps, rosetting. So that means that the plant isn't gaining height. All the leaves are bunched at the top. You know, who knew? Um, you'll have yellow leaf edges so that they, um, you'll have still kind of a green band in the middle, but when you see this yellowing just along the edges, that's a really good symptom for bunchy top. Um, and the leaves also become really brittle. You can just grab it and it'll crunch in your hand. So if you start seeing all those symptoms, you most likely have bunchy top virus. You can also have a reduced bunch size if the virus um, manifests in the plant later on, like closer to the fruiting stage, it'll still um, you know, produce a fruit bunch, but it won't um, develop properly. They'll stay small. Sometimes they won't come out. They'll kind of choke in the top of the neck of the plant. Um, but for all of this, what you need to do is just kill that plant. Like I said, the virus can only be moved from living plant to living plant by the aphid. So if there's no living banana plant that has a, the virus, it can't go anywhere. So in whatever way you want, you gotta kill that plant, whether it's digging it out, using herbicides, having a bonfire over it, whatever you wanna do, you can't, you're not gonna go anywhere productive unless you just kill the infected plant. And you kill the infected plant and you eliminate the virus in that um, plant. Next slide. Um, here's just another example too. On the left is an uninfected uh, Williams Cavendish bunch. On the right side of the left photo is an infected one. You can see the reduction in leaf size, or reduction in bunch size, sorry. Bunchy top doesn't kill plants. That's another thing too you gotta keep in mind. Um, they'll just live infected forever, kind of, or unless something else happens. Um, but you really need to be the one to get in there and destroy that plant, because the virus is perfectly happy just keeping the plant in a stunted state that'll never be productive again. Um, another symptom that's a little bit rarer to see, um, but it is pretty indicative, is when the fruit bunch is forming, um, the male bud, the dangly purple bit at the end of the bunch, um, if it's infected, will have yellow tips that kind of curl out, and the whole bud ends up kind of looking more like a dragon fruit. Um, than a banana bud. And that's a pretty good symptom for a banana bunch top virus too, which is important to know because that symptom is showing when it's fruiting, but it won't be showing necessarily on the rest of the plant. But if you see that, and if you see actually any bunchy top anywhere on a mat, you want to really get rid of the entire mat. You don't want to take cakey from the other side of the mat that look healthy because like, well, you know, it's only on this part of of, of the clump and you know these cake are infected but the ones on that side look clean. Um, unless it's a super, super rare variety that you're desperate to try to preserve, um, you really just wanna destroy the whole thing because there's a latency period where even after you plant, um, actually next slide, I have this here. Yeah, next. Um, actually, can you go one more slide and then we'll go back to that one. Um, if you're unsure, you can pot up your plants in the nursery and give them some time because uh, an infected keiki, even if it has no symptoms, can still grow healthily and look fine for up to four months or more. And then, like a lightning strike, you'll get bunched up. This is a plant of uh, Putalinga kula that was given to me by um, Waimea Valley Arboretum on Oahu. But, you know, I don't normally take plants and just throw them in the field willy-nilly, so I put it in the nursery, tried to see, like, how, you know, I want to give it a little bit of... Um, time to see if it has any secrets, and it did. Um, just about four or five months after putting it in the nursery, after it was growing, then it showed it had bunchy top. Um, so, you know, you don't want to um, move plants around that could have bunchy top. And actually, that's one of the biggest ways that bunchy top moves around on a geographical basis. The aphids move it from plant to plant in a small scale, but people move it through infected keiki between islands, between regions. Um, so not having infected plants is really important. Can we go back one slide real quick? So um, another symptom that is you often see, but it's kind of hard actually, unfortunately, to see the photos here too. Um, but you'll see it a lot in publications and other types of things, but it's called the J-hooks or Morse code. Um, on the left, we have an infected leaf. On the right is a healthy leaf. Um, you have to look at it with the sun shining through the leaf so that it illuminates it. So like, I'll take a leaf and I'll hold it up to the sun and then look through the leaf. And 
99% of the time, if it's infected, um, you'll see these kind of, um, I don't know, they're these little like green striations. And also, it's really hard to see in this, but it looks like lines and dots along the petiole. That's because it causes a discoloration in all the venation of the plants. So you'll see that pattern following the venation. And in here, those hooks come from where the leaf blade connects into the petiole and the little you know, um, vasculature curls down into it. So you'll see those hooks there. If you see that symptom plus everything else, you can be really sure that you have bungee top and you should kill the plant. Okay, next slide and then next, next slide. Okay, corm weevils. Um, bungee top gets a lot of credit and yeah, it's a bummer, but I argue that corm weevils and what we're gonna talk about next, nematodes, are equally as destructive, but in some ways more um, problematic because it can be really difficult to tell what's going on. Often, this will manifest as just weaker plants that don't thrive, and you're like, oh, what is it? Do they need more water? Do they need more fertilizer? And really, it's that they're being eaten alive. Um, but it can be kind of hard to tell what's going on. Um, the banana weevil, Cosmopolites sorditis here, uh, it's about a centimeter long, jet black, um, has a long rostrum like most weevils have for digging and burrowing. Um, they also uh, have just little classic white grubs with a brown head. Um, if you cut open a banana corm and you see rotten tunnels going throughout the corm and you find any of these guys, you have weevils. Um, they're a bummer. You can kill them there. Um, there's different traps and lures and hormones. There are different ways to um, kind of make, um, yeah, different ways of collecting them. But personally, I found that the, the best strategy to manage not only corn weevils, not only nematodes, which we'll talk about a little bit, but also bunchy top all at once is just this concept of clean plants and frequent rotations. Um, again, they're not trees. If you put them somewhere and you expect that they're going to be there 20, 30 years, they're not. They're going to get bunchy top, they're going to get corn weevils, they're going to get nematodes, something's going to happen. So it's really in your best interest to replant early and often with clean plants. And I have weevils, it's a bummer, but it's not something that um, is, like I haven't lost any varieties just from weevils. Um, I haven't had a situation yet, maybe it could change, um, where um, weevils have become such a huge problem that I need to do something else. Really what I do is just try to give my plants everything they need and get a few bunches out of them and then destroy them before the weevils come in and infest them and already I'm on to new patches. Um, ideally, I mean, it depends on planting material, but I'll plant about once a month a new patch all the time, just on rotation so that we always have new plants in and we're always taking old plants out. Next slide. Um, weevils can also be, you can kind of tell the symptoms sometimes and that they'll have really weird distorted growth up top, which can kind of look like bunchy top, but you'll notice they're not necessarily smaller leaves. You don't have that marginal yellowing. It'll just be messed up. And that's because they really love going straight to the meristem. They'll burrow through the corm. And sometimes I'll take young cakey and I'll see a little tunnel when I'm cleaning them. And I'll notice um, a tunnel that maybe I can cut out. So I follow it and I'm trying to see if I can find the weevil and save the corm. And more often than not, that little weevil knew exactly where to go. It went straight to the growing point and is eating where the plant is growing. It's like a tender salad bar for it. Um, and that'll manifest by distorted growth, which uh, next slide, you'll see these kind of just like leaves that don't come out properly. Um, they're sort of choked like they're, they're still rolled up in each other and trying to make a new leaf. Very often that's corm weevils. Um, so it's sort of like bunchy top where it has a bunch top but without reduced leaf size, without yellow edges and without brittle leaves. Next slide. Um, corm weevils also will weaken the corm to the point where whole bunches just fall over. So if you see plants falling over at the base where it's like snapping on the corm or right above the corm, that's often um, a sign of weevils because they literally just ate the corm. And you can see in here all these rotten necrotic tunnels. Um, you know, and sometimes these plants will still fruit okay, but the next generation isn't going to fruit very well. Um, and if you take a cakey from there and establish a new patch and you give it everything a banana could want, compost, sunlight, water, mulch, 
if it has weevils in it, it's never going to thrive and it's never really going to take off and do what you want it to do. Next slide. Um, so the next pest is nematodes. They are even more difficult to diagnose than corn weevils because you really can't see them. They're microscopic worms that live in the soil and eat the roots. Um, the sign of nematodes typically though is just toppling. So whereas the corn weevils, typically when they fall over, it'll be from the corms breaking in half. Um, nematodes will be that the corms kind of fall out of the ground because the roots are rotten. There's no more roots to anchor the plant in the ground. So if you have plants that are just falling over all the time and you're like, oh, what's the deal? It's very possible it's nematodes. Um, if you dig up some roots you can, and cut them in half lengthwise, um, you can see sometimes necrotic rotten portions in it. Um, and um, they, I mean, it's really hard to see in this photo, but you'll see rotten roots and that's a sign of nematodes. Um, next slide. So um, we're going to talk about propagation um, and actually how to take care of nematodes and corn weevils um, and then bungee top. But um, before we get there, we're going to talk about the two basic types of suckers. Um, you often hear water suckers versus sword suckers. And uh, there's this kind of half truth that sword suckers, the ones on the left, are what you really want. Um, they typically have really small, narrow leaves, but big, fat corms. Um, water suckers, by contrast, or sometimes they're called umbrella suckers, um, usually have larger leaves and smaller corms. Both are actually totally fine for propagation. It's just a matter of what you're planning on doing with it. So if you're going to planting directly in the field, out in the sun, um, especially if it's in a rain-fed area where you're not having it have water right away, um, you want that big corm to hold it over until it gets established. Um, if you plant a water sucker out in the field, um, it doesn't have much starch or energy reserves in the corm, so often it's just gonna perish and die right away. Um, especially if you plant them mixed together in a planting, sword suckers, water suckers, different types, um, the sword suckers may establish and grow and be healthy and even if the water sucker would later, it's going to be outcompeted by those other ones and just never really be able to catch up. Um, but water suckers are actually really good for planting in the nursery. Any little bit of a banana plant, if you can get it rooted in the nursery and make a healthy plant and then plant it out in the field, it's totally fine. So sometimes I'll actually prefer um, using water suckers and actually have a whole propagation system based on artificially getting the plant to produce water suckers so that I can propagate them. I would really love to share all that today, but that's a whole, uh, I'd take another hour, um, which I'm actually going to be doing that uh, November 6th in Kona at the Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Conference. So if you want to know a lot more about banana propagation, we'll be doing that there. Um, next slide. Um, anyway, so you dig your suckers. Um, you want to clean off the soil and then pare them down. So that means peeling them like a potato. Um, you don't want any surface of the corm that was in contact with the soil to remain on the corm. You want to shave it all down. And what that will do is if there's nematodes in the roots, um, you get rid of them. Um, they can actually burrow down into the corm. So we're going to do another step too. But what, what this will also do is give you a really nice visual of the corm and if it's um, infested with weevils. Because when it's all muddy and dug up and you know, full of dirt, you can't really tell if there's rotten tunnels in there. You need to clean that plant and visually inspect it. And if the corn looks good, like a peeled potato, you can be pretty sure that it doesn't have weevils. Sometimes there's eggs or microlarvae that could be hiding in there. Um, and also that it doesn't have nematodes. But to be extra, extra sure, next slide. Um, you can take those and put them in a hot water bath. This was actually my very first method of doing this. This is just a, but I thought I'd include this slide here because it's the simplest method, which is, this is like a turkey deep fryer from Goodwill on a, you know, propane burner. Um, just like a little five gallon pot. Uh, you want to bring it up to 130 degrees um, and have the plants in there for 20 minutes. Um, alternatively, if you don't have the hot water, you can also do bleach 20 minutes uh, at, for it with a 10% bleach concentration. Um, also is effective, but I find that 
I like the hot water better because then I don't have to worry about where I dump it. And if you le accidentally leave them in the bleach too long, it can really damage them, whereas the hot water just cools down and it's kind of fine. Um, what I use now is like a propane on-demand hot water heater and I fill up a cooler and then that way it keeps the temperature better and I can fit more in it, but same concept. Next slide. Uh, so after you have that, um, you could plant them straight in the field. I personally, if I can help it, only plant rooted plants. Um, that's because being a certified organic grower, um, weed competition, you know, we have limited options. I don't spray to kill weeds. So the best thing you can do is make sure that your crop outcompetes the weeds. And if you plant a sucker that was just dug out, and especially if it's been cleaned of nematodes and paired in corn, it can take sometimes three, four weeks, sometimes up to two months to really get like rooted and growing and healthy again. And the weeds don't care, they're already growing. So, but if you plant a rooted plant, it's gonna start growing on day one and you're gonna have a lot better stand establishment, a lot better weed control um, because the plant doesn't have any delay. So I like to pot up in the nursery. And again, November 6th, Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Conference. I'm gonna be giving an hour long lecture, a deep dive into banana propagation with all of my tips, tricks, secrets, myths and legends about um, how to propagate bananas in every single way that I've tried. Um, I would love to share more about it now, but yeah, it's, it's too much. But if you do this, if you can do these basic things, um, it's all better than just digging out a cakey and throwing it in the ground. Um, this is really the core of it, is making sure you have clean plants and making sure that you know how to know what a clean plant is. Next. Um, so my personal preferred, like I said, is a rooted plant, typically one to two feet tall. Um, that's easier to handle, it takes up less nursery space. Um, I usually use a one gallon pot, that's sufficient. Um, if I have a really big corm and it's a variety that I um, really wanna plant, I might have to bump it up to a three gallon pot. Um, but bananas don't really, you don't really get that much advantage by leaving them in the nursery and having them be larger. Um, as long as they're rooted, yeah, they're pretty much ready to go in the ground. Um, you want them to be bigger than your weeds, ideally, so you know, I'd say the absolute smallest I'll go is like maybe an eight inch plant, but that's only if I really, really want to plant this bed today and they're not quite ready, I'll do them. Um, but usually about one to two feet tall. And on the left there is an example of the plants that I produce for myself in the nursery, um, kind of through that technique I alluded to of forcing water suckers. Um, anyway, next. So now we're gonna talk about kind of how I plant and this isn't necessarily like I said earlier, the only way, the best way, what I recommend that you all do, it's just where I'm at now in my banana growing evolution. Um, so if we can, um, I'll do a occultation or you, know, you um, put down a dark cloth over the soil to kill off all the weeds of beforehand. Um, I prefer using the woven weed mat because it's easier to move with less people. Um, I have used silage tarps in the past, and I do use them for some cases still, but with a small crew, they're kind of difficult to move, so the weed mat's a little bit easier, and I just weight it down with cinder blocks, um, once, one every 10 feet or so. Um, this is just to you know, really help kill down any of the big guinea grass or other things as a starting point. Um, I might do a few flushes of this. If can, time it with the rain, so you pull it off, you get weeds to sprout, you do it again might do a little bit of ripping or disking with the tractor, depending on if the bed's been worked before. Uh, next. Um, and then I do what I guess call it a trench planting method. Um, so I built a, it's really simple, but it, it's like, it's a custom banana trencher that just is to the size that I prefer. Um, but I rip two big trenches and then I can put all my amendments in there. Compost, fertilizer, whatever, whatever I wanna do. Um, next. But holes are fine too. Um, I don't have any problem just digging an old fashioned hole, but just for my scale, uh, it's not you know, practical. Um, last week, uh, me and my full time crew were able to plant 500 bananas in like two days with, well that's like all amendments, putting the plants in the ground, irrigating everything, um, just by 
you know, digging the trenches. If we were digging holes by hand, like, I'm like, sorry, Dash, I can't make it. I gotta, I'm digging holes all day. Um, but if you do dig holes, that's fine. Um, I highly recommend um, putting whatever extra amendments you want straight in that planting hole. If you have really hard, tough soil that hasn't been loosened up or cultivated before or in a long time, you want to make a bigger hole, um, almost like a big pot in the ground. I find that bananas tend to, um, well, let's contrast it with trees again. There's a theory about tree planting, which I'm not really an expert in, but I kind of subscribe to it, that you want to not baby the soil too much in the planting hole so that those roots can kind of get a little bit more used to like what that soil is um, so that, you know, they can adapt to it and be like better rooted in the soil there. I think bananas are the complete opposite. Just make a big pot in the ground and fill it with all the good stuff and they'll be a lot better off. They don't really have those big woody strong roots that can penetrate through hard soil over time. If they hit a wall, they're just like, oh, I don't know, I'm done. I'll just stay like a small runty banana. So it's really in your best interest just to dig a big hole, fill it with all the good stuff, and it'll be fine. Um, so yeah, holes are fine. Um, if you notice here too, I have an irrigation line. Um, I always start the irrigation lines right up to the plant. Uh, this just has one little shrubbler. In our soil type, it's fine. Depending on your soil type, the water might not um, move very far away from the emitter, but in ours, like one or two emitters is totally fine. Um, you just want to make sure that you always have good eyesight on the irrigation line and can move it away from the plant as it grows and as it makes um, cakey. Okay, next slide. Okay, so back to my method though. Um, this is my current layout for all of our standard plantings. Um, I would say it's a medium density production system. I've gone higher, I've gone lower, um, but this is what I do for most stuff. Uh, it's five to eight feet between plants, which is dependent on the variety. So some of the smaller, quicker varieties I'll do tighter. If they're larger, slower growing, longer lived plants, I might give them a little bit more space on the eight foot range. Um, and they're in staggered double rows. Uh, between the rows is six feet, and between beds is 24 feet on center. Now, all of those metrics are built around my production system, what I need, my tools. You can play with it for whatever makes sense for you. Um, next slide. This is just a side view to kind of represent what that staggered double row means. Um, it's one bed, like if you imagine a vegetable bed with multiple rows, but the plants are kind of in a zigzag, staggered pattern. Uh, that uses sunlight more efficiently. Um, but also makes it really easy to lay them out and um, to just, yeah, manage it well. If you put them straight across from each other, they might kind of like lean and get a little bit weird, but having the staggered double row means you can fit the plants more efficiently in that space for sunlight. Um, ooh, it's a little dark, but uh, this is what a bed of my, or two beds actually looks like if you look down the row. So this is 24 feet between beds on center. Um, I use 300 foot rows. That's mostly because it just worked out really well with my field sizes and my equipment. If I were growing a 50-foot row or a 50-foot bed, I would still do the same thing. I think a staggered double row about six feet apart works out really, really well for a few more reasons uh, that you'll see in a bit. Next slide. Um, I have gone denser. So this is the same spacing in that bed, but the beds are closer together. Um, this was on only 150 foot rows. Um, and the reason I was okay putting them closer together is because the rows were short enough that I can drive on the ends of them and not have to haul the bunches very far. But on a 300 foot bed, um, I wanted to be able to drive right up to the, the plants and do all my work. So it made more sense to have it further apart. It also, that little bit airier, wider spacing really helps with airflow for Sigatoka control. If you notice in this one, all of the leaves on either side are touching. Um, totally fine in dry conditions, but as soon as we get big rain events, the Sigatoka just rips through there. Um, okay, next slide. Um, okay, this is back to my 24 foot spacing and also why I built this around our system. Um, I believe a lot in mowing. It's our number one weed management tool. So I have mowers all the way down from a weed whacker up to a 12 foot three spindle bat wing mower. And this is fit to my aisles so that I can do 90% of our mowing um, 
with one implement and we, I can mow this 30 acre farm in six hours um, with this, which is great because if it rains, I can just get in there and mow um, and I can manage things really nice and keep getting grass seed down. Um, so again, this is kind of tailored to my system, but you just got to think about what's your system and how you want to orient it. Next. Um, so the six foot between rows in the bed is also really nice for our BCS. So I use a BCS um, to mow and manage weeds in the bed while they're establishing. This spacing I found works really, really good if you can, if you can have good early weed control and then you have a good canopy. You, you have to weed and manage for maybe the first like four to six months, but then that canopy fills in and it's really, really minor. Um, I have patches that, you know, I weed them for the first six months and then basically nothing for the next two years. Organically irrigated, the weeds have every opportunity to grow, but the bananas won. Um, so anyway, that's what that looks like. Next. Another nice thing about this staggered double row system is that um, it crowds the plants just enough that um, they lean out a little bit. Um, the crowding is actually kind of a good thing. So in organic agriculture, it's often a really common thing that your biggest weed control strategy is good stand establishment and just out competing the weeds. So the bananas can tolerate it. And even though they're denser together and you might see a little bit less yield per plant, your yield per acre is the same or higher. Usually higher plant density means a higher yield even if the yield per plant is smaller. So it's all things being equal, it's better to go higher density. Um, but bananas will tend to lean, say, towards the light, but really it's away from shady areas. Um, and when they do that, as they're leaning, that's where they tend to throw their bunches. So in a situation like this, I have all my bunches just lined up and ready to harvest uh, down the line. And that's, you know, I didn't do anything special, just how I arrange them when I plant them. They just, they just do it. Um, next slide. Um, okay, this is back in the bed again. All of the debris, when I clean up, always goes to the middle. Um, this kind of relates to that shade dynamic again. Um, once there's good weed um, control early on and all of the plant debris, the trimmed leaves start coming down into the bed, there's really almost no weeding to be done in the bed. Maybe a little bit of spot weeding here and there if a, some morning glory or glycine or guinea grass gets a little confident. But otherwise, um, it's pretty minor. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about some mixed cropping systems. Um, I'm, I love bananas, clearly, but I'm not all bananas all the time. Um, and I do experiment with and play with, you know, different mixed systems. Uh, when I used to be a veggie grower and was integrating them with the bananas, um, our plantings kind of looked something like this. So this is a banana field that uh, we're just utilizing the aisles for lettuce um, while they're establishing. You know, that first four months especially, you have a lot of sunlight um, that you're gonna have to be managing in some way and you might as well be managing it through growing more food. Um, so that's one option. Next. Uh, this is uh, in that same field, but a little bit later on in a different style. Um, this is a row of Iholenas on the left. Some Olena, Kahlo, eggplants. Um, kind of going back to that thing about shallow roots and not disturbing them. All things being equal, you really shouldn't probably plant turmeric this close to bananas because when you dig that up, you got to dig up all those roots. Um, so if I were to do it again, I'd probably do the Kahlo next to the Iholenas because um, Kahlo, even though it's, you kind of dig it up, they're mostly above ground and it's more like a yank than a hard dig. Um, but in any case, um, I tend to like doing this. Sometimes I'll plant stuff between the plants. We'll get to that in a bit. But more or less, um, I like to just have the different single beds mixed in a bigger planting. It makes management a lot easier. Next. Uh, this is that field a little bit later on. Everyone's happy. Um, the Iholenas actually on the left have about a seven-month crop time from planting to harvest, which is a little bit similar to Elena, and maybe on the short end, but doable for Kahlo, at least in our area. Um, so I was kind of experimenting with that as being one crop, where the Iholenas were actually just a one-bunch crop, and then take them out, but um, 
So still experimenting with that system, but this is just what it looks like as it's going on. And field of egg plants right there. So, you know, I don't really recommend planting bananas too far in with veggies because they cast so much shade that you're really, it's hard to have both. So if you want both in a small area, you're, I think you're better off having like your banana patch and your veggie patch, but just, you know, have them next to each other. Next, um, I've experimented a lot with different ground covers and living mulches. Um, I've kind of given up on it in my situation, and that is just because we're in a really dry area. So establishing um, broadcast, like, you know, a broadcast cover crop with overhead irrigation is really expensive water-wise. But also, because we have to water it, we can't really rely on good rainfall for establishing things like this. Um, I have to have irrigation, which you can kind of barely see a little micro sprinkler in here. Uh, this is white clover. It did great, but then when I still got to manage it every once in a while, weed it, um, it ate up the irrigation. I got to pull it out. It's a headache. So I just think, you know what? It, I think it's better if you have like a more natural rainfall environment and you can just get in there and mow without um, worrying about it. But that's something I've tried in the past. Uh, next. Uh, this is mixed with pumpkins. Uh, I guess I'm just showing this as something that I've done, which you might consider doing, but I would actually never do it again. <laughs> um, I found that the pumpkins grew too fast for some of the young bananas, and it actually overwhelmed some of them. And then when I went to go harvest the pumpkins, it was really difficult to figure out where they were without messing up some of those young bananas. There might be a way to have the timing work out just right, um, it was cool as a ground cover, but um, it might work in a different situation. So I, I would give it like, you know, try it maybe, but I, don't, I wouldn't do it again. Um, but what I do use bananas for, this is kind of going back into like a, a different realm of bananas. Instead of focusing on the bananas as the main crop and what you would do to support them, this is how I use bananas to support other things. Um, so we have some shady areas on our farm um, that I've tried growing bananas in, and just because of that little bit of extra shade from some big monkey pods, um, they fruit in about half the, or not half, twice the amount of time um, as if they were 20 feet over. So I'm like, not worth it. <laughs> like, same amount of work, half as much yield. Um, so those areas of the farm... Um, I'm establishing orchards, which I don't mind if they're slower and the trees can gain height and stay up there and reach the sunlight. Um, but I'll plant them next to old banana rows, and then we can use all that mulch to mulch the trees. This is a row of uh, uh, ulus and coconuts um, next to a banana patch that's just about to be phased out. So in this case, we planted all those, and then I cut all these um, bananas down, used all the leaf and pseudostem debris to mulch those young trees, and then actually used that bed as a propagation bed. Um, and what I mean by that, I guess I got a little preview of that propagation workshop, but um, I cut everything down, stabbed through the growing points, let them flush cakey, cut them down again, stabbed through all the growing points, and then at that point can just harvest. From this bed, it was a 150-foot bed. We probably got like between one and 200 plants a week for a solid like two, three months um, of just pulling off little plantlets and then go rooting them in the nursery. Um, there's a lot more details about that, which we don't really have time for now. But anyway, it's one way to do it. Next. Uh, this is another similar system. All these cages are trees. We got some chompadex and mangoes. Um, and in this case, I'm using the bananas kind of like that short-term veggie for the bananas, but just in the aisles while the trees are getting established. Next. Uh, this is that same planting a few months later, um, you know, getting nice and diverse, and we got some pigeon peas in there that can be mulched down for the trees. The bananas will come down as mulch too, and as soon as they get back, I actually probably got to cut all this down and uh, free it up a little bit. But um, I am into mixed plantings. I also just got to pay the bills, so I have one foot in both worlds. Next, uh, this is just another example too of like how I would plant bananas near other things that I'm looking to establish. These are uh, a cage with some direct seeded chompadax. And um, this banana is just at the point where like I'm gonna pull all those cakey off so that the mat doesn't get too out of control. Uh, I'm gonna have those bananas for a bit, probably let it fruit like two or three times and then see where it's at. Um, but when I do this kind of situation, 
I kind of like to do one of two things. Either plant the most hardy varieties that are gonna last the longest so that they're there to provide mulch for as long as amount of time as possible, or I go to the complete opposite and plant the weakest, wimpiest plants because they're the easiest to remove when you wanna remove them when the trees get established. So it kind of just depends on the situation and the spacing, but I do a little bit of both. Okay, next. So for the growing portion, we're gonna talk about harvesting next, but for the growing, with everything I said, here's what you gotta keep in mind, the keys to success. You wanna choose the right variety for your needs, which we didn't really have time to talk about now, but it is something to consider as you grow more and more bananas. Um, there's a lot of differences between varieties and how they behave. Uh, you wanna start with clean plants. That means free of BBTV, free of nematodes, free of corn weevils. Uh, you wanna water, give them as much sun, uh, food, mulch as possible. It's really hard to overdo it with bananas. There's a point where you can economically overdo it, but logistically for the bananas, in most scenarios, they'll kind of take whatever you can get them and just go bigger, faster, stronger. Um, you wanna have an exit plan. Um, this is one of the biggest issues I see with growing bananas is you plant them in all these different places, but inevitably, after a few years, they get bunchy top, they get corn weevils, they're shading something out, they wandered, and you wanna remove them but if you're boxed in and it's hard to get in there with a piece of equipment or with tools or whatever, it's gonna be really difficult to remove. So I really only like to plant bananas in situations where I have a clear exit plan. Like how am I removing this plant? Because we know that they're not gonna be uh, long-term permanent plants. Um, and kind of going with that is replanting frequently and ideally before you have pest and disease issues. The ideal planting schedule isn't in response to pests and diseases, it's as a mitigation for pests and diseases. If you're constantly replanting, you know, think back to something like tomatoes. You wouldn't plant a tomato crop and expect it to yield for five years. It's like if you want tomatoes all the time, you should probably plant a new patch of tomatoes every like two months or something. Just, you know, constantly putting them in and expecting that you're gonna be taking other ones out. Um, and then you really want to, again, remove the entire mat at any sign of pests or diseases, especially with corn weevils and nematodes uh, and bunchy top virus. Um, it, you, there's not much you can do to salvage a plant. If you want to salvage an old banana plant, the best way to do it is to try to get cakey off of it, clean them up, and start a new patch. Going back and trying to thin out a big old nasty patch and work with it, isn't gonna get you very far. They're never gonna be as productive. Uh, okay, next slide. So now we'll talk about harvest. Um, I harvest in a way to try to maximize quality uh, and efficiency. Um, quality for our customers, so I, you know, we can have repeat customers with good high quality fruit. Um, I've tried a lot of different things. Uh, this is, um, I think maybe the only time I tried it, I was like, you know what, I've talked to some old school growers, kind of medium scale growers, and they all do field packing. So that's basically just cutting the bunches, de-handing them in the field, throwing them in your crates or boxes and taking them out. I was like, oh, let me try it out. And I, I hated it personally. It totally works, except you get sap over everything. Uh, there's no way to clean them. It's really hard to like handle stuff. You're just like working in the mud. If it's a rainy day, forget it. Um, but that's one option. It still maybe is viable for like really, really small scale. Um, but if you want, if you're looking to scale up your banana production or have it be something where you can be really proud to take high quality fruit to market, then you're gonna wanna think about another system, uh, which I'll show you next. Um, okay, so back to that system where I have all of our bunches thrown to the aisles, uh, that makes harvesting really, really easy. Um, again, that's just by the planting um, uh, orientation, by, not by any other special pruning or anything. Next. So what that looks like is we have a trailer uh, with, these are just old futon pads thrown in the back of a trailer. Um, our aisle spacing is enough that we can get our truck and trailer right down the aisle with all the bunches just waiting for us to, to throw them in. So it makes it really, really quick and easy to get all the bunches out of the field. And especially for our growing situation, um, we have two different parcels. Our wash and pack facility is not on our main production site. It's about a 10, 15 minute drive away. So I'm gonna have to load them into a vehicle anyway and I might as well do it right at the plant. So next. Our bunches are thrown in the trailer. Um, 
always with pads on the bottom. Um, and if we're going to be traveling on a sunny day, I'll pull the shade cloth over and keep them out of the sun. You don't want your fruit sitting in the sun. It's going to damage it, heat it up, cause you know, lower quality fruit. And also if they're bouncing around in the back of a truck or a wheelbarrow or something hard, um, you might not notice it when you wash and pack them, but as they ripen later on, you'll have a lot of bruised spots and necrotic stuff, and it's gonna really lower the fruit quality the more that they're you know, bumping into uh, hard objects. Next. Um, so the way that we kind of mitigate for that is they come right out of the trailer and onto this rail line. Um, this is just industrial curtain track, ordered online, it's not really that expensive. Um, if you had a really sturdy structure, you could hang it from the ceiling. Um, we didn't, so I built these, I just welded up these um, braces to hold it up. But um, I can throw all the bunches in there. Um, we get them out of the shade, or sorry, out of the sun into the shade so they can start to cool down. Um, they're all hanging up. There's no pressure on the fruit, um, so we can mitigate all the damage. And then we can, you know, spend the afternoon in the pack shed, put on some music, and clean bananas. So they kind of go down this little roller coaster and then come out to uh, before our wash tub. So next slide. At that point, we dehand the fruit. On the left is before I had that rail system, and you see I'm, I'm a little bit bummed. I'm not as happy about what's going on. You have to handle all these bunches. I mean, I'm a relatively young guy, but I would like to farm for a long time, so we really got to think about our backs. Um, you know, lifting 50, 80 pound bunches all day, um, taking them off the plant, putting them in a trailer, taking them off again, holding them up, doing this, like it's, it's not fun, it's not good for us. But if you do do that, I recommend having this big stem end down and you can kind of use that as a spindle. But, you know, I like hanging them up. So we hang them from that end and then you can rotate the bunch around freely. You can use both hands. You're less likely to cut yourself because you don't have to hold stuff and try to cut. It can all just be right there in front of you. Um, so we cut off the hands. Uh, next slide. We'll cut them up into whatever size section we want. It's different for different varieties. I do everything from singles to clusters of like six to 10, just depending on the variety. Um, but whatever it is, we, we clean off all the little dried flower bits. Um, or any fruit too that is like obviously if it's cracked or half eaten or got smashed in the trailer anyway, we just take that off and put the good fruit in this wash tub. Um, we can spray it down. We can spray out gecko eggs and roaches and dirt or whatever, spider webs. Um, and then they kind of soak in there and it also allows the sap to drain out um, and into the water where we kind of have a, a drain at, on the top side of the other end where the water can kind of um, let the sap run off of the surface of the water. If you put a little dish soap in here too or any kind of soap, it'll help dissipate the sap and have it not stick to the fruit. Um, you can make really, really nice clean bananas, but if you have too much sap in your water, when you pull them out, they're gonna be like coated in the sticky sap and you sell them and like, why are your bananas sticky? Um, and, uh, you know, we want to try to avoid that. We want happy customers. Um, okay, next slide. After they come out, um, I usually set them out and drip dry. I actually don't normally have this much fruit just sitting out. This was the day I was just packing it by myself, and I was like, oh, I thought it'd be nice. Normally, there'd be someone else here packing them into boxes after they dry a little bit. Um, but anyway, if you can, it's good to have a little bit of a drip dry just so they're not, like, totally sopping wet, but it depends on what your system is, if you're having them in boxes or crates or how they're going to be stored, but it's something to consider. Uh, okay, next. Um, Eholenas and some other varieties, I'll do singles. This is just kind of to highlight that um, you really still got to think about what your variety is and try to like, understand it. Eholenas have really, really weak pedicels, and when you cut them into hands, they kind of fall apart anyway. So I just do them the favor and put them into singles, and then that way we can pack them really nice in boxes and all the fruit stays um, undamaged and clean and easy. Okay, next. Um, but this doesn't have to be a big scale. You can do all this on a small scale too. You don't need to be intimidated by your 500 gallon tanks and banana roller coasters. Um, I started off with just, you know, doing it on the ground and putting them into like a 50 gallon stock tank um, and just washing them cleaning them up, but it really does help a lot. I mean, sure, you can still sell bananas that are like unwashed and ungraded, but once you start really breaking into markets that 
you know, like they want your food, they want more of it, like it needs to be clean. You don't want to send a case to somebody and have one up and have a bunch of geckos and roaches run out into the kitchen, you know, you're not going to get many repeat customers that way. So it's really in your best interest to, you know, do all the cleaning in the pack shed, make it nice before they leave the farm. Um, oh, and for dehanding, I just use a typical, this is a Victorinox harvest knife from Johnny's. I've tried the different, especially banana dehanding knives and stuff. They work good for some varieties, not for others, but just a good serrated knife um, is all I use to dehand, and it works out pretty good. Okay, next. Um, so yeah, we'll crate them up. Um, if they're going to stay on farm or go to our farmers markets or to customers that have um, we have a good relationship with, I'll put them in those like returnable black crates on the left. That way we don't have to um, you know waste money on boxes that we'll never see again. Um, but for customers that you know it's a little bit more casual or they're not as frequent um, or I don't have that close relationship with. We'll just go into boxes, and usually I pack about a 30-pound case. That's the average for me, um, which is a nice size because the, the boxes don't necessarily get that much cheaper the smaller they are. So you want to have them, you know, pack as many in a case as you can. Okay, next. Uh, and by the time they get to market, um, this is a really tricky thing, which some of you may know. Um, people generally only want to buy ripe bananas or just about to ripen, which is a pretty difficult thing to manage um, on a small scale, and I still consider myself very small scale, despite, you know, okay, 30 acres, but, uh, you know, that's, that's small in the banana world. Um, but that being said, I still, I do have a walk-in cooler with some uh, different temperature zones, which I can kind of slow the ripening a bit or speed it up if I need to. Um, but when I get to market, I always try to offer a lot. There's a gradient from green to ripe up there, which is, looks nice. It gets people interested. Um, they're probably not going to buy the green ones, but having that many bananas helps bring in more people. Uh, I think across the board for any produce, the more you bring, the more you sell, but you have to bring way more than you can sell to get people to buy the lesser amount. Um, and you might know that from marketing stuff. But, uh, but anyway, I try to predominate with um, ripe bananas or just about to be ripe. Um, Next slide. And as you can see, this lady, see, she, auntie there, she's, she's only grabbing the ripe ones. So that's what we see all the time. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so it's a little bit how I might arrange them at a farmer's market. This is when we used to grow veggies too, so it's not solely bananas. But next slide. Mahalo for your time and attention. Thank you. So that's the core of my presentation. But we have... I hopefully is still generous question and answer period. I know there's a lot I probably didn't cover that you guys want to know because there's so many. I mean, we could have a week-long master course on all this stuff, but um, I guess we'll open it up to questions. And there's somebody here that's going to manage the questions, or I think you got to come up. Okay, sorry. You got to if you have a question, you got to go up to that microphone on the uh, by that pillar over there. Hi, I'm Christina. That was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. My question is, what we do when we harvest a clump is then we cut down the whole shoot. Um, shoot. Thank yeah. you. And then we cut it up and then kind of place it around. And we've had a lot of success. So yeah. that, like, acting as mulch. And I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, that's basically what I do, too. Um, there is a dynamic, it's, it's kind of subtle, but so it's not that important, but it is real that the more impact plant you leave on the mat, like all of that will be reabsorbed in the plant. And it's a lot more efficient, like nutritionally and physiologically for the plant to leave it attached. Um, what that means is that if there's a variety that I can reach the peduncle, which is the stem that connects the bunch to the rest of the plant, I'll cut it there and then I'll leave the pseudo stem intact and typically just cut the leaves off and use that as mulch because those, I don't want them just dying there and you know, uh, hampering airflow. Um, if it is a taller variety, usually it's just where the machete reaches. So it ends up that I leave about maybe a five foot, five, six foot stem section, pseudo stem section, and then the rest, whatever comes down, I cut it up and mulch it to the center of the bed. So yeah, it's a totally viable strategy in doing it right. 
Hi, Next I'm question. Karen. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, the first is you talk about starting new plants, uh -huh. but yet you're talking about taking the kiki. Now those are from the existing plant. So if you're starting new plants, you can take the little shoots on the ground and get them rooted? Or are you talking about getting completely new shoots from some other plant somewhere else? Either. Either. So Yeah, as long as, if you have a healthy mat, mm -hmm. it's totally fine to take from that mat. It's okay. just if you don't have, if your plant is infected with bunch top virus anywhere on it, say it's a big healthy mat, and you have one or two keiki coming up that have bunchy top virus, don't take the keiki from the other side of the mat that look healthy. Go get from some other plant that doesn't have any symptoms. Okay. Yeah. And then if you've got, say, bungee top or the um, uh, fungus, mm -hmm. can you put those leaves in the mat or should you get rid of them as well? Um, well, you wouldn't, if you have bungee top, you shouldn't use it to mulch because you just kill that whole plant. So, there wouldn't really be a sense. You definitely okay. don't want to use it as mulch on a different plant because even though the plant material itself isn't a danger, the aphids that are living on it are. Okay. So like if you cut an infected pseudostem, it's going to have a few hundred to a few thousand aphids potentially living in all the little nooks and crannies of that plant. If you have that near another plant, as soon as that starts to dehydrate, and the aphids are like, oh, something's wrong with this plant. It's not giving us sap anymore. And we're going to go to a different plant. And if the closest one is one you're trying to keep alive, then no sense in that. So you want to take all that infected material. And I usually don't take it very far. Like what I'll do is um, dig them up, put them in the aisle, and like mow them with the tractor and just blast them like right away. So it'll just like, hey, you're done. <laughs> yeah. Or I'll feed it to our geese. They like eating them. This is a follow-up to her question. You talked about cutting them, you know, the stem off higher. Yeah. I've been cutting them off right at the ground after they fruit. Will that stem eventually die? What happens to it? I mean, then yeah, you push it'll it just over? senesce, and all of those, uh, the water and the nutrients in that tissue will be reabsorbed in the rest of the plant. Okay, thank you. I'm shorter. I also want to say thank you. Um, yeah. I have two questions. Okay. So my first question is, um, I think Karen was asking, uh, I've been offered some volunteers. So how do you take them out and know that you have everything you need? What do you mean by volunteers? Well, you know, whatever, you the cakey. Okay. So they're, you know. Like how do, how do you get them off the plant? No, out of, they, they're either on the ground or they're right up next to a healthy plant. So I've had someone say to me, you can take these cakey. Yeah. So how do I do that and know that I have all of what I should be taking? And Ooh. I might have missed that because well, I came in late. Dash had mentioned a demo part. I don't know what that had in mind. I don't know if there's plants around or tools. Um, digging out cakey for propagation definitely takes some skill. It's a hard thing to explain. But you need the corm. You need the... Um, that fleshy, collar-looking bit at the bottom. If you don't have that, you didn't do it right. Okay. Um, in fact, it doesn't need any other part of it. You can cut off the leaves, cut off the pseudostem. You just have to have the corm. Okay. So I would say, though, generally speaking, you want to dig closer to the mother plant and further down than you think is necessary, and then it's probably enough. Okay. It's really easy to go too close to the keiki and not deep enough, and then you usually crack the corm in half. Okay. So try to go like in and down further than you think is required, and then... Practice makes perfect. Okay. Um, and then the second question is, what do you do with all the fruit that you don't sell at the market? Um, we eat it. There's not that much. I mean... Oh, you sell enough that you just, you don't have Yeah, to. I mean, I don't know. If sometimes we'll give it away or give it to the geese or we just eat it. But, I mean, I would say, like, when, like, in the pack shed, we're culling, I don't know, it's probably, like, 1% or 2% of the fruit that comes in isn't. Will you use it again as compost or? Yeah, or, no. yeah throw Animal. it on some bamboos, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm, Hello. Thank you. I am new to gardening. Okay. So you talk about the corm. If I was to dig up the whole plant, if there was this fungus disease problem, uh -huh. how big is the corm for an established type of banana? 
It's basically just right underneath wherever you see shoots. Oh. So it could, could it grow in a pot or you need to put it in? Yeah, they'll just adapt feet. to the size pot that you have. So if they're not going to, you know, if you have it in a smaller pot, you'll get a smaller plant. If you have it in a big pot, you'll get a big plant. Is it easier to control disease fungus if it's in a pot and maybe away from other banana plants? I'm, I'm a brand mm, new. No. No. Okay. No, and it'd be a lot harder to control water and you need a really big pot to have a full size plant. Okay. Yeah, not easier. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a follow-up question about um, the, uh, what you do with a, a mat or a, a, a planting hole where you've taken out the plant because your plants have been in infected by uh, uh, nematodes or borer beetles. Mm -hmm. um, how soon can you replant there if um, you don't use any kind of uh, pesticides or anything like that? So it's a little bit, it's variable. For nematodes, because the species that infest banana also can infest many other species, you gotta consider if you have any other host species growing there. And there's a lot of different ways that you can control for nematodes across the board. Um, so you'd kind of do it like, I take all of my cues from like the veggie growing operations where you either have fallow periods or um, you know, working on soil fertility and health and microbial diversity to outcompete. Like, there's nematodes that are non-pathogenic that can outcompete the pathogenic ones. There's different cover crops that can suppress nematodes. So if you already have a lot of nematodes, I'd say you definitely want to like get out the plants, figure out a fallow system that works in your environment. Uh -huh. But then the number one thing you want to consider is not reintroducing them from the beginning. Um, so that's where having the clean plants is um, more important. For the weevils, it's a little bit easier because they only eat bananas. So as long as you don't have any um, living banana plants there for a good amount of time, then there's not like going to be weevils that are hiding out in the soil waiting. They'll, they'll only come from other plants. Whereas the nematodes can kind of just hang out in the soil or hang out in other plants. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you had, um, if you removed a, a grouping because you had bunchy top, uh -huh. um, what recommendations do you have to remediate that soil instead of just letting it go fallow, but to speed it up if you have like limited growing space and you want to reuse that spot? For bunchy top, you don't really need to do anything. Just once the living bunchy top plants are yeah. out and you've treated everything else for aphids with a soap, you should be okay? Yep, it's fine from day one. Really? The only thing that I would say you might want to consider as like a little bit of an intermediate fallow is that if it was, especially if it was a big old mat, you might kind of want to water the area really well and even sometimes like fertilize it. Like I'll sort of do the prep for the next plant, but what that'll do is reveal any little corn bits that you may have missed because if they shoot up, you're like, oh, I missed the spot okay. and you get it. So, you know, maybe a month, but if it's a small plant or you're pretty sure you got everything out, for bunchy top, if bunchy top's the issue, yep. you can plant a new clean plant same day. Because oh. it's only transmitted from living plant to living plant by the aphid. Okay. Not in soil, not in tools. So second question yeah. is maybe killing the, the aphids. Um, everyone seems to be like recommending Dawn. Does it, is any soap work, an organic soap, or does it really need to be like a, you know? A... I mean, I, this probably goes against a lot of like CTAR recommendations and stuff, but I don't really find that trying to do anything for the aphids is useful. The way I look at it is if you know how to identify an infected plant and you take action on killing that plant, um, you get a 90% you know, grade, like good, you got an A. Um, if you kill the infected plant and you control for the aphids, you get a 95%, I don't know. Like, maybe it's like a little bit better, but like, hey, you already did really good. If you kill the infected plant, you kill the aphids, and then you, I don't know, do some other whatever magic thing someone wants, fine, there's always something more you can do, but the simplest, easiest, most important single thing is just to kill the infected plant. So especially when you're dealing with a lot of plants, because, um, again, the aphids don't inherently carry the virus, and they're not inherently problematic. 
The other thing is they're so efficient at spreading the virus that it takes one aphid feeding for two hours to transmit the virus. So that's experimentally. They found like that's the laboratory minimum. Um, so if you're 99% efficient at killing the 10,000 aphids in a mat of bananas, it's not good enough, sorry. There's still infected aphids that are still gonna go. So still the more important thing is just to kill that plant so that they don't have an opportunity to spread it to other places. So it is a little bit of a whack-a-mole sometimes. Like often I'll have a bunchy top outbreak um, and it's like, oh, there's an infected plant and I'll kill it. And then like, oh, another one there and another one there. But like when that starts to happen, that's when I know like, oh, this whole patch needs to just be gone. And then I'm already like, I already have my new stuff planted eight months ago that's about to fruit. Yeah, so. which you wouldn't have taken any of the cakeys from. Not from those ones. You're gonna Unless destroy. it's like a really rare variety that I'm trying to preserve, I might take a cakey that through my judgment, like maybe this plant doesn't have it, and then I'll pot it in the nursery and monitor it, and it works about 30% of the time, but it's like not something I recommend. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Especially not for common varieties. It's like totally not worth it. Okay, yeah. uh, and I, I'm sorry, Mr. Earlier. If you did, you mention um, do you use a like a banana peel tea as part of your fertilizer? No, no, it's not. It's not worth it for the amount of uh, nutrient that you'll get from it. No. no. Okay. And I, I sell most of my banana peels, so oh. <laughs> they leave the farm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you give us some insights on distinguishing black cigatoka from normal leaf senescence? Sure, so normal leaf senescence tends to be a lot more uniform. When you have an old leaf that's just sort of dying, like it'll go from green to lighter green to yellow to dead. But for cigatoka, you'll see necrotic lesions. It's kind of splotchy. Um, there'll be discolored parts of the plant that like it'll start dying directly around that part instead of the entire leaf slowly all at once. When should the fruit be harvested? At the first sign of yellow? Or is there something else we should look out for? Okay, good question. I get asked this a lot, when to harvest fruit. If you wait until they're ripe, effectively, it's, it's I'd say it's too late for market. It's fine for home use, but it's really hard to catch them where they're just starting to ripen, but not too ripe, where they're not full of birds and rats. Um, and so what I would do, especially if I'm working with new varieties that I don't have a good sense of, because I'm always trying out new varieties, um, the first time I grow them, I'll let them mature until I get one or two ripe fruits, just so I know what their peak maturity looks like. But then I study the unripe fruit. And the size, the shape, the color, of that unripe fruit, I know is peak maturity. For bananas, the point that you harvest them doesn't really matter that much. Um, unlike something like papayas or pineapples, which get their sugar while they're attached to the plant, bananas only get their sugar from the starch that's already in the fruit. So the starch breaks down from a complex carbohydrate to a simple carbohydrate, and that can happen after harvest. So it's really more about size, um, but it just takes practice. Um, I would say you know that you harvested at the right time when after you harvest them, they ripen in about seven to 10 days. If they take longer than that, if you're in like a two week period of waiting for them to ripen and temperatures are relatively warm, you probably harvested a little bit early. Um, but harvesting them when the fruit is full size, but before they start ripening will also give you longer shelf life. Because if you harvest them when they're starting to ripen, then they're starting to ripen. You gotta like move them immediately. Whereas if you harvest them while they're still fully green, but just at the you know, edge of starting to ripen, um, then you have a, little, a few more days to work with green fruit, which is easier to transport and less prone to damage. Can aphids acquire bunchy top virus from heliconias or is it only spread between bananas? There, it's complicated. Uh, I don't know the full answer to that question. Um, there very recently has been some heliconias that have been shown to host bunchy top virus. Um, it's not totally clear, though, if the aphids 
that feed on heliconia also prefer to feed on bananas. So there's like a bunch of tops, a pretty complicated disease um, because you have the plants, you have the virus, and you have the aphids, which all have their own biology that all has to come together. Um, so I would say like it's probably possible. There, um, certainly there are instances of it, but I don't personally think it's worthwhile to go eradicate all your heliconias for the sake of bananas. Um, also, the heliconias that are that have been infected with bunchdot virus have symptoms that are kind of similar to bunchdot virus. So don't go killing sick heliconias for no reason. But yeah, it's probably possible, but I would say generally not something to worry about. Hello, Hello. thank you. Um, is black psychotoka, if you leave the leaves, I've noticed that sometimes dying leaves on my property will curl up and towards instead of just hanging and like becoming frilly. Is that the same disease or is that something different? Um, like while they're attached to the plant, you mean? Yeah. Uh, it could be, but I don't know. I have to see. Like they could maybe, I've never really seen that. Mm -hmm. um, or it could be like Sigatoka combined with some other weird stuff going on. Okay. But generally you see like these kind of <clears throat> narrow black streaks and then like you'll start having leaf lesions dying like directly around them. Like it spreads out from them. Mm -hmm. uh, second question is, um, is there a resource to go to to figure out what is the ripening process of specific varieties that you use or could recommend to newer you mean like farmers? The, like shelf life timing or stuff? Um, more so like what it looks like when it's ripe because like I bought a red Cuban dwarf and like I had, it was difficult just to find out when it would ripen besides the typical wait for brown spots kind of mm, idea. I don't know that there's a good resource for it, but I just say like be colorblind and use your other senses. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I call it the peel test. Like if you can peel it, it's probably fine. Okay. Um, aroma is a good one, softness. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's like a hard and fast rule. And like, cause color across the board is meaningless. There's bananas that start off yellow and they ripen more yellow. There's bananas that start off green and ripen more green. There's bananas that start off red and then they turn green and then they ripen yellow. It's like, uh, forget about color, just peelability, aroma, softness. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. I learned so much from you and I look forward to a talk on uh, banana biodiversity to find out what other kinds. One day you could talk about, because we're my whole family is hooked on apple bananas and we don't love Williams, and that's about as far as we've gone. I would love to talk about banana biodiversity, but you probably have to ask Dash to invite me back. We're, we're going to so. request that. Actually, there is, I think from last year's or the year before, Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers, when it was remote, I did an hour-long presentation called World Banana Tour, which is on YouTube somewhere. Mm. It was me talking for an hour about global banana diversity. So you can great. start there. Uh, and my question was, um, you spoke about fertilizers without mentioning what else you do aside from compost and mulching. Uh, I've tried out all kinds of different things and I'm still experimenting. My newest one is chicken manure. Um, trying to see if that can be, we have a, there's a new chicken farm that opened up near our farm and I can get as much manure as I want. So I'm trying to chop chicken manure. Uh, we have pretty high potassium already in our soil. Potassium is really important for bananas, but it seems like we don't need much supplemental potassium for a while. Um, so it's really more of a nitrogen issue uh, for us. But you know, I've used everything from high quality compost, low quality compost, tankage, fish emulsion, water-soluble potassium sulfate, now chicken manure, kind of what you have. And there's no right answer for fertilizer because the first thing is like, well, what's, your, what's in your soil already? You know, like there, you can't really give a fertilizer recommendation without having a soil test or something to base it off of because what's good for my soil might be detrimental for yours. And it's just, it's kind of meaningless to, until you have those metrics. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? A couple of things. Uh, so for Bunchy Top, I heard you mention glyphosate and then also uh, burning. I, I maybe missed, did, you talked about like weed mat and just choking them out. 
I didn't. Is that a strategy? I don't, or? I don't believe in it. I've never seen it work. Effect. I mean, maybe it works. It seems to take a really, really long time. And I don't know if it's easier. To, I don't know. I've never done it because I've seen other people do it. I'm like, that looks like a mess that I don't want on my farm. But uh, maybe it works. Have you tried it? Uh, not. I could do a better job. Like, I want to try another round for a couple clumps that we're going to remove. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, maybe it can work. I just, it doesn't work in my system. And because, um, like, what I'll do is for our production stuff, part of also our aisle arrangement and how the beds are arranged, I have enough room that I can get in our tractor. It's a small tractor, 45 horsepower. And with the front end loader, I put our pallet forks on them. And then I have, like, a little digging fork. And I can get under the plant and just pop it out. And then I make sure I have the rotary mower on the back. So I pop it out, throw it in the aisle, mow it. And I dug out and obliterated an infected plant in three minutes. So, that's so pretty much backhoe for a lot of these guys that don't have access. Some piece of equipment that can lift it up because it's so labor It's ideally, and, yeah. yeah. But the other thing, too, which I didn't quite touch on because it ends up being a really deep, complicated thing, which requires more like probably more of like a hands-on workshop is that the way that you prune the mats, like if you prune them early and often and you keep the mats small and tighter, they'll tend to sucker less individually, but also if you do that and plant them in a little bit denser of a bed, they really sucker a lot less, but not too, like it's, they still sucker enough. Like Namwa, for example, is a classic, just like vigorous, like, you know, it's almost bamboo. It's like, oh my gosh, we have these big mats. I've found that if you plant Namwa on the spacing that I highlighted, uh, six feet apart between rows, six feet within rows, staggered double row, and you do two cakey prunings, timely cakey prunings in the first six months, maybe one at three months, one at six months, the mats basically set themselves up with for very little maintenance. Um, you kind of establish that apical dominance you don't have as much crazy, out-of-control cakey growth, but you still have enough to repopulate. Um, and then at that point, if you do have an infected plant, you have a much smaller, more manageable plant to get out, and it's actually not even that hard to dig it out by hand because it's just it's not a behemoth. Mm. So it all kind of goes back to management and having that exit plan and like how are you managing it for yourself in three years starting on day one. Uh, you mentioned removing brown leaves. Like, are you, is that part of your protocol? How are you printing those that these guys could easily? Yeah, well, I don't typically remove dead leaves, ideally, because I remove them when they're starting to die. They're a lot easier to cut when they're fresh. Um, I actually have a tool that I, don't, I probably didn't invent this, but it's an independent origination. I call it the stickle. It's a sickle on a stick. Uh, <laughs> and it's a really simple, easy thing. And I actually... I have them on an uh, extendable uh, painting pole, so that way if I have a tall plant, I can just whoop, and get up there and clean around the bunch or pull off dead, um, dying leaves. Um, but yeah, I tend to do it like just on a regular basis as a general maintenance. You know, it's kind of like, yep, like whatever, you know, mow the grass, prune the bananas, harvest them. It's just part of our routine of like always being on top of it. So always cutting dying leaves while they're still supple before yeah. they're brown and dry because they're so hard to cut. Yeah, I mean, if tree. you don't have... It's just a really good tip, like, for yeah. the home growers and people that want to manage the clump on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, if, if you don't have, like, Sigatoka or something, then, like, you don't want to take out leaves that are green because they're, they're contributing photosynthetically to the plant. But once they start turning yellow, because just through natural senescence... Just cut them off then. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just remembered um, with the rise of being able to buy plants on um, Etsy or even now Amazon, mm -hmm. is that something that you would, uh, or if you've even done that yet, is buying interesting varieties online and then cultivating them out from plant tissue culture all the way? Or is that... I don't recommend it. Not just because the fact that it's technically illegal, not that you're going to necessarily get in trouble for it because, like, inspections aren't really rigorous, but if you're buying stuff, like, through tissue culture from Florida or really 
anywhere like mail order. Uh, the chance of you getting the right variety is like a crapshoot. So, you know, buyer beware. Um, there's also this kind of complicated thing, which I won't dive into too much, but most of them are produced from one lab in Florida that um, tends to have a lot of off type. So even they might be identified correctly, but they're mutations that are kind of detrimental. And so you, they're low quality plants. Mm -hmm. The other thing is there is more and more people like bringing in, um, you know, plants from Thailand and stuff and bouncing them around and, you know, going around quarantine. Um, I don't recommend it. Like, it's possible, but like there's a, we might think bunchy top is bad, but trust me, there's way worse diseases out there that we don't have in Hawaii that I don't want to bring in. Um, I do introduce new varieties relatively frequently, but I do it through uh, International Banana Gene Bank where all the plants are in tissue culture, they're virus indexed, they're certified clean, phytosanitary certificates, I got my permits, and I bring them in through the state and uh, USDA offices. Um, so I would say it's probably not worth it. Like, there's actually a fair amount of diversity if you start looking hard enough in Hawaii. Um, it's be relatively, you're not going to find much useful stuff that isn't already here. Or if there is, like, I'll bring it in and I'll give me some time. I'm working on it.